Hello, and welcome to another 30 Minute Thursday. My name is Amit. It is 2 p.m. in the beautiful, still summertime Pacific Northwest, and we are live on Facebook. I hope everybody's doing great. Hope you're staying healthy. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying sane. Very important to stay sane in an otherwise insane world. And uh, I hope everyone's enjoying what is, at least here, a fantastic summer. I don't want to like upset anybody or, or tell you just how great it is out here, but the sun is shining, the skies are blue, it's uh, not even 80 degrees, it is really, really nice out, it is just picture perfect Pacific Northwest summers, we don't have them very long, they definitely cost an awful lot of rain and gray and gloom in the nine months leading up to the summer, but once it's on, it is really on over here, and, and I gotta tell you, I love it. I, 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 I'm enjoying the sunshine. I'm enjoying the fresh air, even though we do have some forest fires and wildfires in other parts of the state and other parts of the country. And that smoke kind of gets blown around a little bit, but um, it's, it's just glorious. So uh, with that said, I hope you guys, wherever you are, are enjoying your summer, are enjoying uh, your time with your family, with your friends, with your business and your colleagues, clients, what have you. I'm going to jump right in and tell you what else is on in addition to the beautiful summers of the Pacific Northwest. What else is on? The big short is on right now. And I don't know if you guys know what this means. I do not mean to speak in cryptic ways. I will explain it to you. But the big short is happening right now in the U.S., treasury markets. Now, there is a movie and a book about what happened in 2008 called The Big Short. Um, this is not that, but it does have uh, undertones and um, similar circumstances to that in some ways. So um, what's going on right now is speculation. And that's the, this is not investing. This is speculating. Now, some people may call it some things. And some people may say, well, you know, it's a calculated risk. It's a mitigated gamble, whatever it is. But it's a speculation. Like when you buy a stock and, and you sit on it for months and months, if not years, that's kind of an investment. But when you are short selling the market or various components of the market, that's a speculation. Now, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm not here to say that's bad and this is good or whatever it is. I just want to let you guys know what's going on because interest rates, mortgage interest rates on the 30-year fixed, uh, I'm, I'm seeing on some rate sheets, they start with an eight. That is correct. Eight percent on the 30-year fixed, somewhere between seven and a half to 8% in many cases. In some cases, a little bit less than that, uh, 7.25, 7.375, but with points, meaning with uh, uh, multiples or, or percentages, I should say, of the loan amount to buy down the interest rate. So if you're doing, let's just say, a $500,000 loan and um, the, the lender is charging you one point on that $500,000, that means that in order to deliver whatever interest rate you're getting, it's going to cost you an additional $5,000. 1% of 500,000 is $5,000. That's what one point means. And one point does not necessarily mean that you're gonna get an interest rate that's a point lower, 1% lower than what the uh, prevailing interest rate means. That is just the cost now of getting into this industry or getting into this loan or getting you know into financing. I apologize, guys. As part of this beautiful summer, I've got sunshine and I'm trying to find the right angle to get the lighting right. So um, rates are going up. Uh, there's no other way I can, I can describe it. I would like to see them come down. I think everybody would like to see them come down. I think um, there's reasons why they're coming up. I'm gonna cover them right now. But in general, rates are going up on mortgages and on other things as well. And why is that? Because as I said, the big short is on in the U.S. 10-year Treasury market. And I'll explain exactly what that means. The U.S., our government, our, our country, finances our national debt by selling IOUs to whoever will buy them. Investors, investment houses, foreign countries, anyone and everyone who will buy our debt, we sell it to them. 
And in many cases, the form of that debt is an IOU, a treasury note payable over 10 years. That is uh, one of several instruments that the government uses to finance our debt, but it happens to be the one instrument that is in close parallel, close parallel to the 30 year fixed rate mortgage instruments. They're not identical. They're not the same thing, but they move very sympathetically one to the other. So what happens in the treasury market with regard, in the 10 year treasury, I should say, with regard to interest rates is the same sort of tide that is dealing with the interest rates on the 30 year fixed rate mortgage that my clients and your clients are, are dealing with when they're trying to buy a house. So they are very sympathetic. Now, the investment world, investment world, the speculators are betting against the US economy right now. And they have sold short $800 billion worth of 10 year treasury notes. What that means specifically, well, in big picture, what that means is that these speculators are expecting that the economy and that the fight against inflation will not go well in the short term. And as a result of that, the interest rates that the 10 year treasury note is going to pay are going to go up. And the cost or the value of those 10 year treasury notes that are trade that are already printed, these are IOUs that are already printed, the value of those is going to go down as the interest rate goes up. That's what these speculators are betting on. And the way they're betting on it, and by the way, just as a reminder, if the interest rates on the 10-year treasury note goes up higher, the interest rate on the 30-year fixed rate mortgage will also go up higher. Not identical, but a rising tide lifts all boats. Okay, so what, what these investors, speculators are doing is selling short on the 10-year treasury note. What that means basically is that these speculators are borrowing 10-year treasury notes. They're borrowing a piece of paper that says, I owe you $100 million from the US government treasury note. They're borrowing that from a brokerage house and they're selling that to other speculators on the other side of that transaction. You can't have a sale without someone wanting to buy, right? You can't buy anything without someone offering to sell it. Those of us who are looking for real estate to purchase in the Pacific Northwest and there's no inventory, you understand that, right? You want to buy, but no one wants to sell. There's no deal, right? Well, on this particular thing, the speculators are borrowing IOUs. They're borrowing this financial instrument and they are selling it to someone on the other side of that transaction without actually owning it. They're selling it without owning it. That's what it means selling short. And they're betting that in the coming days, the value of this IOU is going to go down. And rates are going to go up, by the way. That's how that works. But when the value of that IOU goes down, they then will buy that IOU from somebody else at a lower price and deliver it to the person or the institution that they sold it short at the higher price and make the profit. That is what selling short is actually, that's the, me the mechanism or the mechanics of selling short. And you can sell short all sorts of all sorts of things. You can sell stocks short. You can sell bonds short. You can sell commodities short. Let me give you an example, make it really, really simple to understand. Let's say that you guys out there, you sold me a, uh, a, a bag of coffee beans. I love coffee. I'm a coffee enthusiast. Let's say you sold me a bag of coffee beans for $1,000. And you have, we agreed that in 10 days time, you're going to deliver me a bag of coffee beans, and I'm going to uh, pay you $1,000 for that. And you go out now, and it's your job to find a bag of coffee beans and deliver it to me for less than $1,000. So let's say there's a horrible storm or terrible weather events or a fire or whatever it is, and a lot of the coffee crops are wiped out. And now a, a thing, a bag of coffee beans costs 
to buy. You're still on the hook and 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 you've got to deliver that bag of coffee beans for to me for what I paid for it. That's the risk of selling short. But let's say there's an abundance of coffee, right? And you're able to go out and find you've got a magic grower out there and, and that grower will sell you a bag of coffee beans for $100. And you buy that bag of coffee beans from that grower and you bring it to me within 10 days of our contract and say, here's your coffee, give me my $1,000 and you make a $900 profit. That's what selling short is all about. The risk for the, the short sellers is that they still have to deliver what it is that they sold already at some point in time and they're hoping that they can buy it after they've sold it from somebody else at a price less than what they sold it for. But the whole reason that institutions or speculators or people will sell something short is because they believe that bad things are coming in the value of that commodity or that stock or whatever that they're selling. They think that they're going to be able to buy it back cheaper later and deliver it to the person that bought it and therefore make a profit. For those of you who are old enough to remember the wonderful movie called Trading Places, Dan Aykroyd, Eddie Murphy, Jamie Lee Curtis, Donna Michi, great cast, great. It was from 1983, so I'm dating myself. But for those of you that remember this movie, at the very end, the thing about the frozen, frozen orange juice contracts that they basically started selling uh, these things at the very end, the la one of the last scenes of the movie. This is how Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy got rich. They knew that the orange, uh, the orange crop report was going to come out and say that it's going to be a normal crop, that there's going to be plenty of, of orange juice down the road. But there was an inflated market. People were buying and buying and buying. And as they bought, the investors, the speculators, as they bought the orange juice, um, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, their characters, started selling those contracts, right? So they sold it at a high price. And then suddenly there was a, an announcement from the report from the Agricultural Commission in the movie that said orange juice crops are going to be fine. The winter didn't impact them. And all of a sudden, everybody realized, wow, we bought orange juice at $100 a bottle and it's only worth $10. And so they started selling. And Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd's characters, they waited for that price to come way down. And that's when they started buying back to complete their trades because they still had to deliver the orange juice contracts, but they sold high, bought low and made a killing. That's what these investors or speculators are doing right now in the, in the markets. Uh, and to the tune, by the way, let me check my time, we're good. To the tune of $800 billion right now in short interests, betting against the 10-year treasury note, basically betting against our government and the Fed's fight against inflation. They think it's going to get worse. That's why they're selling now, and they expect to be able to buy back at a lower price and make a very big profit in between. And so that's what's going on. Um, I, it makes it does not make me happy to report this, guys. It does not. Uh, I, I'm not thrilled. Uh, I'm just telling you what's going on in the market. I, I've been doing this for more than two decades, and I've never seen an interest rate sheet that has an eight on top of the number. Like that is a new phenomena for me. And um, that's a really kind of frightening sort of thing. Now, what's going on with this whole short interest is going to. Uh, it doesn't culminate tomorrow, but there's a lot going on right now that's driving this because there's a symposium of central bankers. So members of the Federal Reserve Board of the United States, members of the Bank of England, members of the Bank of Japan, central bankers from the European Union, all of these people are meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming right now talking about what's going on with inflation, what they're dealing with in their own countries, with their own currencies, et cetera. Tomorrow, Friday, the 25th of August, Jerome Powell, chairman of our Federal Reserve Board, will be speaking to the media and telling us basically what the Fed's stance is going forward. 
Now, what these speculators who are short the market on U.S. Treasuries, what they are expecting is for Greenspan to come, uh, Greenspan, I'm sorry, that was a previous Fed chairman. Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a slip. But um, what they're expecting is for Powell to come out and say that inflation is still tricky and sticky and it's not going away and we're going to have to keep raising short-term interest rates and we're going to have to keep crunching away to make this thing go away, to, to make this monster uh, get back in the barn, basically. So they're betting on that. And then Powell may very well say that because inflation hasn't gone down. We're still really much higher than the Fed has targeted. The Fed has targeted 2% year-over-year inflation. We are stubbornly at 4.7% year-over-year inflation. So he may very well, Powell, that is, may very well come out tomorrow and say, um, we're not done yet. We got a lot more raising to do. We got a lot more tightening to do. And uh, we, we've got to combat this inflation because it is the number one problem that we're dealing with. That may very well happen. And if it does happen, then these short speculators will probably be rewarded financially at least, and we'll see interest rates continue to go higher on mortgages, which is not great for me or for my clients or for my referral partners or for anybody really, because the economy needs housing and, and it's it's very hard for people um, to get into housing when these interest rates start going in this direction. Now, one of the things that the Fed is working on and one of the measures of what's going on with inflation, one of the things that they're, one of the signs, if you will, that the Fed is looking for in their battle against inflation is they want to see higher unemployment rates. They want to see higher rates of unemployment, meaning more people not working. And there's a reason for that as well. The reason is because when there's low unemployment, when there's a lot of companies are looking to hire people, they have to pay more, right? Basic supply and demand. If you're look, trying to fill positions and everybody's working, everybody's employed, then you're going to have to pay me more to leave the company I'm currently working at to go to your company, right? I mean, I've got to be incentivized with some money usually, and that's what the Fed is trying to discourage. So when there's higher unemployment, not as many people working, then the people that are working aren't going to go into their boss's office and demand a raise, because look, there's a high unemployment rate. You know, we can find other people to do your job for less money. So they're not going to ask for raises or bonuses or those sorts of things. And when they don't get raises, when they don't get bonuses, people basically are living on the same income that they had beforehand, but prices are higher because inflation is higher. Guess what? They don't spend that money on things like vacations or new cars or large screen TVs or whatever it is, they make do with less because they've got to conserve what they do have in income. And as they stop spending money, the cost of things has to come down in order to find that equilibrium where people will spend money on that. And so this is what the Fed has been trying to do for a long, long time for uh, since March of 2022, when they started raising interest rates, their stated goal was to see higher rates of unemployment as a way of bringing down inflation. Now, here's the problem with this. I've said this before on various um, various 30-minute uh, Thursdays, and I, I don't mean to, to come off like a broken record, and I certainly don't mean to come off like a, a partisan person, but the books are cooked, and the Fed while it wants to see higher rates of unemployment, the information that they're getting, the statistics that they're getting from agencies like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, those numbers are cooked. They're, they're lies. And, I, and I'm not, this is not me pointing fingers at individuals. This is me telling you that yesterday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out and said, this is them, not me. They said that between April, I'm sorry, between March of 2022 and April of 2023, they misstated the unemployment rate by at least 
300,000 jobs, meaning that they told the Fed, and they told all of us, by the way, that there are $300,000 300, jobs more than they're actually worth. So they basically, I don't want to say they lied. I don't want to say they fabricated it, but they were wrong. Okay, let's let's just chalk it up to an honest bureaucratic mistake. But they were wrong. And the Fed is working on information like they're, they're not all knowing and all seeing. They have to input all this data that they receive from all of these reporting agencies and they have to process it and digest it and see what's going on with it. But there's an old saying in computer programming, garbage in, garbage out, right? Well, guess what? The Fed's been getting fed a stream of garbage from the statisticians at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's just that simple. I'm not saying that these people were, were criminal in doing that. I'm not saying that they did it deliberately necessarily, but they certainly did not do their job as well as could have been expected. And so the Fed has been raising interest rates and making monetary policy based on information that is not completely accurate. And one has to wonder, how inaccurate is it, right? Is it just 300,000 jobs that were misstated between March of last year and April of this year? Or is it a larger mistake? Is it a big boo-boo? I don't know. I don't trust large government agencies. As I've said before, Mark Twain, one of my favorite writers, said it time and again, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. And we can torture the numbers and the statistics until they reveal whatever we want them to. So take this with a grain of salt for whatever it's worth. You make your own opinions on what the motivations are for these things. But I personally look at this through the eyes of my clients who are being charged points for their mortgages, who are being charged higher interest rate for their mortgages, because this is the environment that we're in right now. And then I find out that these government statisticians and bureaucrats are wrong. And that all of this, or a lot of this that we're in right now is based on information that was fed into the system that was a mistake, at best a mistake, at worst a calculated lie. And I that upsets me. It upsets me for my clients. It upsets me for myself. It upsets me for my referral partners. This is the nature of large government entities. We're not going to get past that. This is what we have to work with. But this is what we're working through right now, is this sort of the blind leading the blind. So the Fed is making decisions um, on what to do with interest rates based on information that they're getting that's incorrect. And you find out, you know, a year after the fact, oh, so sorry, we were wrong, we miscounted. Well, you know, that makes a huge difference in a lot of what's going on here. But this is where we are. Let me check my time. Okay, so tomorrow, Friday, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, is going to come out from this uh, symposium of uh, bankers, uh, central bankers, and he's going to tell us what they are planning to do or what they how they feel about where things are now the next fed meeting happens september 20th so there's still time and in that time there is going to be another um, labor unemployment report there's going to be another consumer price index report on the rate of inflation uh, there's going to be a uh, a perch, I think the PCE, the uh, the personal consumption expenditures report, which is the Fed's favorite inflation measure. I think there's going to be another one of those released before September 20th. Don't quote me on that. But there's going to be more information. How cooked are the books? Who knows? But this is kind of where we are right now. So what's happening, though, the reason these interest rates are going up is because there's so much short selling going on. Now, short selling, remember, selling is selling. And when institutions or people or whatever, when they sell bonds, when there's more sellers than buyers of bonds, the price comes down. As the price of bonds comes down, the interest rate goes up, whether that's a 10-year treasury note or a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. When the price of the IOU goes down, the interest rate goes up. And that's what we're seeing right now. So 
That's a lot to digest. And I want to leave you with a different thought as we close the loop on this 30 minute Thursday. Of course, next week, I'll be talking with you guys about what else is going on uh, and, and how everything happened on Friday, tomorrow, and what that does for us going into next week. But I also read a statistic that I find very interesting, and I don't know exactly how accurate it is. So again, statistics. But what I read was that for every 1%, the 30-year fixed rate, the interest rate on the 30-year fixed goes down. For every 1% lower on the 30-year fixed, 5 million buyers will come back into the market that are currently sitting on the sidelines. So if we see a reduction of 2% on the interest rate on the 30 year fixed, 10 million people will come back into this housing market with a vengeance. Right now, it's still a tough market, especially in the Pacific Northwest. We do not have a ton of inventory. We've never had a ton of inventory. We're not suddenly going to get a ton of inventory. It's been tough, but people are still writing offers and getting their homes, even with interest rates where they are. But there's still a ton of pent up demand. And when these interest rates come down, and I don't know that it's going to happen in calendar year 2023, or even in calendar year 2024, to be perfectly honest with you. But when that does happen, for every 1% in interest rate reduction, five more million buyers to compete against. So pick your poison, guys. This is kind of a tricky place to be. I totally understand why someone wouldn't want to sign up for a mortgage that starts with an eight. I totally get that. But I also remember when in 2021, when mortgage interest rates were a lot lower and there was a ton of competition and there were people escalating 20% above the asking price. So, I mean... (sighs) It's expensive either way. There's an inventory shortage, and that's going to create problems for people who want to buy. Supply and demand is still with us, whether we're talking about uh, the equilibrium between buyers and sellers of houses, whether we're talking about the equilibrium of buyers and sellers of, of bonds, of stocks, whatever it is. Supply and demand, macroeconomics still has a say in this. So if you are interested in buying a home, if you want to secure that for yourself before 5 million or 10 million more buyers come into this market nationwide, I recommend that you buy now, swallow that that jagged pill of the interest rates for now and plan on refinancing next year or the year after. But get your home now because it's becoming more and more difficult to buy a home. And I do not, whatever else happens, let me see, yep, we've got time. Whatever else happens, I do not envision a situation like we had in 2008 and 2009. There might be other things. There's definitely going to be more ups and downs in our economy. I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not telling you that we're out of the woods. What I am telling you is that the people that own homes right now, who you're waiting on to become desperate to sell them, will not be desperate to sell them. They may sell them, but they're not going to walk away from them. They're not going to sell them for a loss. They're not going to say to the to the bank or the lender, here are the keys, I'm gone, y'all do what you want with it. That was a totally different situation. So yes, there will be more pain in this economy. I, I, I wish I could say better and different, but I'm not going to lie to you guys, but it will not be what we experienced in 2008. It will be different. Uh, but if you want to get a house, now is the time to do that. Let's get the house while everybody else is freaked out because these interest rates keep going up. Let's get you into that house. Let's get you situated into your new home. Let's unpack, paint the walls, hang your artwork in a year or two or 18 months or whenever it is, we will refinance. But that's where we are right now. So with that note, We're right at our time. I want to thank you guys once again for spending a few minutes with me on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. For those of you who are in the Pacific Northwest, get outside and enjoy that beautiful sunshine, that beautiful blue sky and fresh air. For those of you sweltering in my former home state of Texas and other parts of the South, enjoy the air conditioning. I'm sure it's a a blessing. And for all of you guys, please stay safe stay healthy, stay sane, come back next week. I'll tell you what went on on Friday and in the days following. And until then, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me today. Have a great day and a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye.